All right, guys, so I wanted to try um, some more Nyquist because it seems like there was some confusion out there. So instead of actually giving you solutions to problem set five, some of the questions, I was actually just going to do a video solution. Just I thought that might be easier to kind of talk through. All right, so let's look at, um, in particular, problem 5A. Okay, we'll look at 5A and 5B because I think those are those are good ones to look at, particularly B. Okay, but A is a little bit easier, so let's start with it just to get the basics down. L of S in that case is K times S plus 10 over S plus 1 times S plus 100. Okay, now. What we got to do is to draw the Nyquist plot. Okay, we got to say, well, what contour do we do? Okay, well, the contour that I look at in this case, let's take a look at it. Let's draw that contour out. Okay, so I've got, according to this, I've got a pole at minus 1, a 0 here at minus 10, and I guess way out far away from me here at minus 100 there's another pole okay and so this is the imaginary of s this is the real of s okay and my contour starts at zero goes up to infinity branches around and comes back up okay so this is the the decontour in other words, I'm evaluating L of S at each point as I go up this axis. So in other words, I'm basically saying evaluate L of S for S equal to J omega for omega greater than zero. Okay? That's what I'm doing as I go up this contour. I'm evaluating this guy at each frequency on that point. Then I'm evaluating at S equal to infinity. Okay? And then I'm evaluating as omega goes from negative infinity to zero with s equal to j omega. Okay? That's the big idea. All right, so now to do that, remember, when I'm evaluating for s equal to j omega from omega equals zero up to infinity, what am I doing? Well, as I'm, at that point in time, what I'm doing is I'm evaluating on, on this line here. I'm evaluating the Bode plot. Right? This is the Bode plot. Okay? Evaluating L of s with s equal to j omega for omega greater than zero is the Bode plot, right? The magnitude and the phase give me the Bode plot. All right, so there's two ways to do this. When I'm sitting around doing the homework and I and I and I want to get an exact solution, MATLAB is, is really kind of the way to go. However, right, you're going to take an exam. You're going to have to know some of the basics of how to plot these things. One of the questions that you will need to think about as you do that is the concept of how do I um, how do I make an asymptotic Bode plot and go from the asymptotic Bode plot? All right, so I'm going to do this two ways. I'm going to do the asymptotes of the Bode plot on this, and and from that try to make an evaluation. All right, and then I'm going to do it from MATLAB to get a little bit more exact. Okay, so let's start with the Bode plot. Okay, now one thing to kind of note about this guy, I, I, I'm going to or maybe two things. When I do this, the first thing I do is I'm going to say let's 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 start with k equal to one. Okay, that way I I don't like evaluating considering changing k's. I do everything for k equal to one, and then I kind of change k from there. Because remember, basically my Nyquist plot just kind of grows or shrinks based on the value of k that I select. All right, now, knowing that, the thing about my Bode plot is, remember, let's take, for example, if I have a, a single pole system, and let's say it's 0 0.1 s plus 1. If I have that type of a system, the Bode plot looked like that, where this is 10. If I have 1 over s plus 10, that also has a pole of 10. 
But that guy, if I go through and, and you look at, if you look at how the, I developed the approximations for drawing the Bode plot, I did it in this form. And it needs to be in this form for this approximation method to work. So I need to get this guy into this form. So this becomes 1 over 10 times 0 0.1 s plus 1. In other words, if I see 1 over s plus 10, then this guy becomes that. He's shifted down, in this case, minus 20 dB because of that 1 tenth in front. Okay? That's kind of an important thing to remember. I think I saw that last time with you guys in problem set 5 when you were asking me questions is I don't think you fully appreciate how the how the Bode plot was kind of derived. You have to go back and look at the notes on that to figure out how we actually derived that process. Something like I, I assumed that it had to be in this form and by be, it being in this form it led to a plot that looked like this where it starts at zero and drops. If I have one over s plus a pole there's going to be a DC gain that factors in. Okay and you can go back and look at the notes and, and see why that is um, if you look at how we made those approximations. Okay, so the reason I mention that is because that's the way everything is written here. Okay, so I'm actually going to have to factor that guy around. I'm going to have to say, I'm going to go fit all of this on my screen here. And... That was weird. Okay, all right. So let me say, um, let's say I have L of S equal to S plus 10 over S plus 1 times S plus 100, like that, okay? S plus 10 over S plus 1 times S plus 100. Now, if that's what I've got, I gotta factor that into 10 times 0 0.1 s plus 1 over 100 times s plus 1 times 0 0.01 s plus 1. Okay? See how that was done? I factored out the 100 from here, and I factored out the 10 from up here. Let's see if I can center this a little bit better. Okay? All right. So, let's draw the Bode plot for that guy. According to this, I've got a DC gain in the front of 1 tenth. Okay? 10 divided by 100. So, let's draw the magnitude first. log 10 of omega and this is 20 log 10 of the magnitude of L okay what is that going to look like well I start out at negative 20 dB okay and I see that at frequency of 1, let's just dimension the axis here, 1, 10, 100, 1,000. I'm going to be constant up until I hit this first pole. So I'm going to drop 20 dB in that decade. Then I'm going to level off because I've hit a zero, right, at 10. And then, from that point onward, I hit, um, I got 100, I hit another pole. And so now, I'm falling off at negative 20 dB per decade, okay? So, pole causes me to fall. Pole and zero cause me to flatten off. Adding another pole into the mix means I've got two poles 
one zero. That's the net effect of one pole and a drop at negative 40 dB per decade thereafter. Okay? So that's the magnitude. All right. What does the phase look like? What does the phase look like? Now the phase looks like this. Let me see. I, already, I wrote this out in my solution as I was trying to write this out. So let me, rather than try to make that as I go, let me see if I can sort of explain that. Okay. Here's that same magnitude plot up here. Okay. So falling, leveling off, falling. Down here is my angle. Let's, th let's think about my angle. Okay. I've got a pole at omega equal to 1. We said that if I have a pole, then my angle starts to fall about a factor of 10 below that pole. So I start to fall at about 0.1 radians per second. All right. By the time I reach the pole, I should be at basically minus 45 degrees. Okay, so that's right here. Now, at that point, this gets a little bit tricky because where's my zero? Well, my zero is at 10. Okay, so as a result of a zero, my phase is going to rise 90 degrees. And it begins to rise a factor of 10 before the zero. So between 1 and 10, this pole is trying to get me to fall 90 degrees between 0.1 and 10. Between 0.1 and 10, I'm trying to get a 90 degree fall. Between 1 and 100, the zero is trying to cause me to have a rise of 90 degrees. Okay? So the net effect of this guy, the pole at 1, causing me to fall, and the zero at 10 causing me to rise. As I go through one decade, the change is 45 degrees. So the pole is trying to push me down 45 degrees in this decade, okay? The zero is trying to push me up 45 degrees in this decade. The net effect is roughly no change in that decade, okay? Now, what happens from 10 to 100? Well, by that point, the pole at 1 has basically stopped causing any change. Okay? The 0 is still causing a 45 degree rise, but the pole at 100, okay, the pole at 100 it starts to kick in a factor of 10 before it, okay? So basically from 10 to 100, I've got the zero still pushing me up 90 degrees, or 45 degrees, okay? The zero is trying to push me up 45 degrees. The pole is trying to push me down 45 degrees. And so I get sort of a net effect of leveling it off in this decade as well. So essentially for two decades between one and 100, my, my phase is pretty much flat at 45 degrees. Now, once I get out here between 100 and 1,000, the first pole has stopped causing any change. The second pole at 10 has stopped causing any change. Now I'm only seeing the net effect of the zero at 100, sorry, the pole at 100. The pole at 100 is going to cause me to drop another 45 degrees between, in, I guess, in the decade after the pole. So in other words, between 100 and 1,000, the pole at 100 is going to cause me to drop another 45 degrees. Okay, And so I see a drop, and then I level off. Now let's think about this. I started at 0. I ended at negative 90. Okay, That should make sense. Think about it. By the time I get out here, I have two poles that have caused me to drop a total of 180 degrees, one zero that has pushed me back up 90 degrees. So the net effect should be a 90 degree drop. Okay, if you think carefully about that, the net effect should ultimately be a 90 degree drop. I'm trying to make that a little bit more stable there. Okay. Now, 
what do I need to do? So what I did was I tried to map that onto sort of my polar plot here. Okay. So because I start out at low frequencies at so I start out at low frequencies at negative 20 dB, that means my gain is 0.1. Okay. So for omega greater than zero all the way up to omega equal to 0.1, this whole Bode plot maps onto that one spot. Okay. Now, once I get to about point one, at that point, all right, what happens? Well, at that point, the magnitude is still the same, okay, between point one and one. The magnitude stays the same, but the angle begins to change, okay? What's that going to look like? If I've got a changing angle, okay, a changing angle, but a constant magnitude, that will map to a circle, right? So, in other words, a circle has a, has a radius that's constant. So the magnitude of the vector that's swept out between here and here is a constant. Okay. So I get down to about minus 45 degrees. Okay. I get down to about minus 45 degrees. And then what happens? Well, at that point, all right, I'm basically at this frequency at this point. Okay. At that frequency, what's going to begin to happen is my magnitude is going to start to fall, but my my angle stays more or less the same. Okay, that's kind of what I see here. Okay, I tried to draw sort of a line headed in towards zero. So my magnitude is dropping, but my angle is about the same. Okay. Then I've got a point in time, basically from here to here. Okay, where what's going on is my magnitude is the same my angle is the same but really I don't move I sort of stay stuck at this point okay then what happens well then my magnitude begins to fall again and my angle begins to fall okay so that's going to cause me to move in towards zero okay I got a dropping magnitude and I've got a dropping angle, which is going to cause me to move. So my magnitude is going to cause me to move in towards the origin. Okay. The fact that the angle is changing is going to cause me to move towards the negative 90 degree line as I do so. Okay. So basically, if I think about this, as omega keeps increasing beyond this point, I'm going to get closer and closer to the origin, and I'm going to get closer and closer to an actual negative 90 degrees. So I'm going to sweep out something like that. So again, let's let's recap that. Basically, I sweep out from here. So basically, for all frequencies up to about 0.1, for all frequencies up to about 0.1, I basically have a constant magnitude, no change in angle. I basically sit at that spot. Okay. Then from 0.1 to 1, the magnitude is constant, but the angle is changing. That's a circle. Okay. Then from 1 to 10, my magnitude drops, okay, and my angle stays pretty much constant. That's basically me coming in towards the origin. Then essentially from 10 to 100, I've got a magnitude that stays about constant. I've got an angle that stays about constant. And so I sort of sit right there at that spot. Then what begins to happen? Well, from 100 to 1,000, and really beyond, really beyond 100, my magnitude is dropping, which is causing me to get closer to the origin. And my angle gets forever closer to minus 90. So basically, I'm getting smaller and turning, OK? Smaller and turning, turning towards negative 90, OK? So remember, when I talk about these angles, I'm talking about basically the angle from this axis. So if I'm at a point right here, the angle to that guy would be, I don't know, about minus 70 degrees or something like that to the point that I'm trying to point at right there. Okay. Now, the thing to remember about this is what, I, what I'm drawing here is asymptotes. Remember, the real, the real phase, for instance, the real phase is an arctangent function. And an arctangent function is not straight lines like this. Okay. So if I were to go into MATLAB and see the real phase, I would see that the real phase is not flat, okay? It actually will kind of bounce around negative 45 degrees a little bit. I tried to sort of show that with my 
crappy line there, but I think you kind of get the idea, right? So the asymptotic Bode plot gets me gets me good enough to kind of get a rough idea of where things are going. Remember, the critical thing I need to do is probably pay very close attention to what happens when I have crossings at negative 180 degrees, right? Whenever I'm kind of over in this range. Now, according to this, at least for positive values of k, I will never have any kind of encirclements of minus 1 because i got nothing over on this side of the imaginary axis. There's nothing over there. So there's really no chance of me being able to have that kind of a, of a problem. All right? So what would the full graph look like? Well, the full graph would end up looking something like this. Okay? Here's the part for omega greater than 0, which I showed before. For omega uh, less than 0, I'm basically going to start at this point. This is basically omega, omega equal to infinity. I'm basically sitting at the origin. And then I begin to sweep out back here towards where I started. Basically just a mirror image of what I had for the, for the high frequencies. So what I see in this case is um, basically... Um, for k greater than 0, there are no poles of L of s ever in the right half plane. So p is equal to 0. Okay? The number of net encirclements of minus 1 is 0. All right? For any positive gain k, all that's going to happen for a positive gain k is this guy's going to shrink or get bigger. But I will never encircle minus 1. So if I, if I have n and p equal to 0, n plus p is equal to z, must be 0. So this guy is stable no matter what. Now, let's do the same thing for minus 1. Well, what would that do? So just to understand, if I put a minus 1 into my transfer function, so if my transfer function became minus, um, I'll do it this way, 1 tenth s plus 10 times s plus 1 times s do it this way. One tenth times 0 0.1 s plus 1 over s plus 1 times 0 0.01 s plus 1. Okay. That was my transfer function. I put a minus sign in front of it. That means the I've added to the entire transfer function an angle of minus 180. Okay. So think about that. What does an angle of minus 180 mean? Well, it means that if I take a point right here, which I said was minus 45 degrees, that point would move from minus 45, minus 180. So minus 45, minus 180 is going to be over here, okay, at positive 135 degrees. All right, I'm going to move over, basically I'm going to map over 180 degrees, which means take everything over in this area, and flip it over to there. Okay, Everything in this quadrant, fourth quadrant, flips to the second quadrant because of the 180 degree shift. Okay, The points over here are not mapping to here, and the points here are not mapping to here. I'm basically moving this stuff to here, this stuff to here, Okay, because it's 180 degrees that's subtracted from each point. So 180 degrees subtracted moves everything from here to here and from here to here, okay? So, if I do this for k less than zero, that takes the whole thing and says, okay, positive frequencies have mapped to this part, negative frequencies have mapped to this part. Now, here, I can go unstable, so let's take a look. Well, basically, I drew this basically for uh, k equal to minus one. With k equal to minus 1, this point of intersection is negative 0.1. Okay? Remember, the magnitude doesn't change just because I put a minus 1 in front of everything. So, so that flip idea was, was nice. Now, the, if I continue to increase k, first of all, if I decrease k, this whole thing just gets tinier and it shrinks a little bit. Okay? That's, clearly, there's going to be no encirclements of minus 1 if I do that. Now, if k is less than negative 10... This point out here is going to push out to minus 1. So at that point, 
if I multiply this whole thing by 10, then this intersection point at 0 0.1 would now happen at 1, okay? So as a result of that, what would I have happen? Well, P would be equal to 0, and the number of encirclements would become 1, N plus P would equal to 1. What does that mean? That means that one pole of the closed loop transfer function has gone into the right half plane, and thus the system has gone unstable. Okay, system's gone unstable. So that tells me basically to summarize, for any k greater than negative 10, this system is stable. For any k less than negative 10, this system is unstable. Okay, and, and we can verify that if we wanted to using MATLAB. Okay, so let's real quick... Let's real quick verify that with MATLAB. Okay, so I wrote this guy. Okay. So first of all, let's check my, my Bode plot here. Begin with my Bode plot. I see exactly what I thought I would see. I start at negative 20. I begin to drop at 1, okay, sort of level off in this range. And I don't perfectly level off between 10 and 100, right, because remember, it's an, it's an asymptote, but it's more or less leveled off. And then I begin to drop again. Now, the other thing I guess that I, I sort of want to point out a little bit, okay, is the phase. So what I said was going to happen is the phase was going to start to drop about a decade before the pole. Okay, And I see that it, it, that's, that's sort of true. It starts to drop about here. All right, That's not perfect, but I see that it sort of starts to. If I look at what, what it actually is at that point, all right, I, I think I've said this before, but the, the actual discrepancy is about 5 degrees or so a decade before, and I see that that's about true. All right, negative 40, so by the time I get to the actual pole location, I see that um, somewhere in this range, I'm right around negative 45 degrees. Now, I had said that between 1 and 100 here, all right, that I would basically be flat at negative 45. In reality, I go down to, it looks like, uh, minus 60 and then sort of back up to minus 30. So in other words, I kind of, yeah, because of the fact that I have an approximation, I didn't stay flat the way I sort of said I was going to do. I kind of bounced a little below and then a little above, basically the same amount below as I did above, okay? So that's coming from the fact that my approximation is an approximation. Now, my approximation was good enough for me to be able to draw that graph, though. Good enough for me to be able to draw that Nyquist graph properly. Now, when do I really need the actual Bode plot? Well, when I need the actual Bode plot is really when I'm in that range where I'm close to um, I'm close to negative 180 degrees. Right, that's when I need to really kind of be careful uh, about what's going on. All right, so let's look at a at a at a better example. Um, that's that's a pretty tricky one, okay. A pretty tricky one indeed. All right, so a good tricky one for sure would be five B, okay. So let me look at that one next. All right, guys. So now let's look at 5b. 5b is a little bit, um, a little bit trickier for sure. I think part of the reason it's trickier is this is one of the ones like I talked about in class the other day, where MATLAB can be a little bit deceptive, right? Let's try to understand that a little bit more slowly. So in a, di a video that maybe you can digest at home more slowly than we can in class. Let's say I've got this guy. Okay. So in, in problem B, 5b. My L of S was equal to K times S plus 100 squared times S plus 1 cubed times S plus 1,000, okay? 
Now, for the same reasons that I said before, so again, let's, here I've drawn my decontour, okay? So I got my decontour, I've got three poles at minus one, I've got a zero at minus 100, in fact, I've got two of them, and I, I do this little break right here, because minus 1,000 is pretty far away, right? Minus 1,000, I've got one pole, okay? And here's my decontour, looping around. Now, I, in class the other day, I kind of said, you know, the figures that I'm drawing are kind of cartoony, and that's kind of true, right? Think about something for a second. When we draw our Bode plots, we draw them on log scales. <clears throat> Part of the reason we draw them on log scales is basically because on the log scale, I take everything between 1 and 10, and everything between 1,000 and 10,000 becomes the same distance. If you think about it, between 1,000 and 10,000, there's a lot more space that's traveled than there is between 1 and 10, okay? But it makes everything look the same. So in other words, it basically takes large changes and makes them about the same size as small changes, okay? So log scales are helpful because basically as I get to really high frequencies and stuff, Essentially, there's a lot of range where there's really nothing happening. So you're basically shrinking what you see, okay? When I draw things on a linear scale, all of that space uh, is basically left in, and, and it, it makes it hard to visualize exactly what's happening because I have to draw these really long graphs to be able to show all of the variation. Basically, by taking everything on a log scale, you're taking these huge graphs and you're shrinking them down so you can see everything in a, in a concrete way okay so just as an example right in this case if I've drawn you know a linear axis what I did was a little break right here to say well and, and then there's a huge gap until I finally hit 1000 okay if I was on a log scale by comparison there there would be these guys would all be relatively close together in other words on a log scale a thousand and one hundred would look closer together than one hundred and one would these two are separated by two decades. These are only separated by one. However, on a linear scale, these guys are way farther apart from each other. All right, these guys are the distance of 99. These guys are a different distance of um, 900. Okay, just to get an idea of that. Now, all right. Now I'm going to draw the Bode plot. I so again doing my decontour basically means okay, I got to evaluate L of s from zero to infinity for s equal to j omega for omega greater than zero. That's a Bode plot. Now, like I said before, in this form, I don't really have something I can draw a nice Bode plot of. Okay, so I factor it. Now, one thing I guess I didn't say before, I, I could give this to MATLAB to draw a Bode plot. MATLAB will do all it needs to do behind the scenes to make that Bode plot correct. For you to be able to use your asymptotic approximations, though, you're going to have to actually be a little bit more careful about that and do that factoring, okay? So I did that here. Basically, I factored out 100 twice since I have two zeros. Okay, I factored out 1,000 once since I've got one pole at 1,000. That means, looking at this carefully, I've got 100 squared over 1,000, which means I get an overall factor of 10 gain on this guy. Okay, so the DC gain on this transfer function is 10. That means that for omega equal to zero, the magnitude is 20 dB, okay, or, or a gain of 10. All right, so let's draw what that Bode plot looks like. So let me write L of S here, okay. L of S is, and I'm going to do it again for k equal to 1. So I got 10 over S times 0 0.1 squared over s plus 1 cubed times 0 0.001 s plus 1. Okay. All right. That is our complete transfer function. Okay. Um, and I should be careful. This should be s times 0 0.01. Okay. s times 0. 0 0.01 because that was at 100. Okay, 
So let's draw the Bode plot. First, the magnitude. Okay. Well, as I said, I got a factor of 10 out in front of this whole thing. If I get a factor of 10 out in front of this thing, that means I begin at 20 dB. Once I, so basically I'm flat in magnitude until I hit the first three poles. I hit three poles all together at omega equal to 1. Each of those poles causes me to drop by 20 dB per decade. So that means I begin to drop negative 60 dB per decade. Right? I've got three of them causing me to drop. It gives me a net drop of negative 60 dB per decade. So essentially, in the first decade from 1 to 10, I drop from 10 down to about 50, or sorry, from 20, sorry, 20 minus 60 puts me at minus 40. And then from 10 to 100, I drop another uh, 60 dB. So I go from minus 40 down to about minus 100. Okay. Now at that point, I hit two zeros at 100. Okay. So in net, I have basically three poles. I have now two zeros. So three poles plus two zeros looks like one pole. And thus, between 100 and 1,000, I'm dropping negative 20 dB per decade. Now, between 1,000 and 10,000, I drop 40 dB per decade. Okay? Why 40 dB per decade? Because now I hit a second pole. So think about the net effect, right? This point, I have four poles, two zeros. Four poles plus two zeros looks like two poles, okay? So I drop 40 dB per decade. This guy drops pretty fast, is what it, what it would appear to have happened. Now let's look at the angle. Angle's going to be nasty, right? What's going to happen? If I have a pole, three of them in fact, at one, all right, then what that means is from point one to ten, my angle is going to drop minus 90, minus 90, minus 90, or minus 270, okay? So at, at um, this guy, the, the, the zero at 100, he begins to kick in at about 10, okay? So let's see what, what happens there. Let's look at that interaction. So I said I had three poles at omega equal to one. So they cause the phase to begin to drop about a decade before they occur. Okay. <clears throat> so in that case, I begin to drop, and I drop down to 270. Basically, the effect of three poles from point one to 10 is to drop from zero to minus 270. That means I crossed minus 180 right there. Okay. That means that is a point at which I can, where I'm going to cross in my Bode plot, or sorry, my, in my Nyquist plot. At this point where I cross minus 180, okay, I know that there's something, something funny is going to happen, okay? I know that I'm going to cross the negative real axis, <clears throat> which means I can get possible encirclements now, okay? Now, what's going to happen after that? Well, there's a zero at 100. Well, the zero at 100 is going to cause the phase to begin to rise 90 degrees. And he's going to rise 90 degrees over two decades. Okay? So here is that two decade rise. Basically, I begin at 10. I end at 1,000. Okay? So I, that causes me, the zero tries to cause me to rise from minus 270 to minus 180. Okay? over some over um, some period of time now here's here's the tricky part okay um, the tricky part oh I should be careful about what I just said I was, I was looking at my graph thinking why does it go up so fast I have two zeros at 100 okay if I have two zeros at 100 that means that from 10 to 1,000, this character, these two zeros, are trying to cause my angle to rise by 100, 
<coughs> excuse me, by 180 degrees. Okay, that's kind of the crucial effect. So, essentially, in the decade between 10 and 100, I'm going to rise 90 degrees. Okay, from minus 270 to 180. Now, because I have a pole at 1,000, that pole at 1,000 causes the phase to the phase rise to decline a little bit. Okay, think about what's going on between here and here. The zeros are trying to cause me to rise 90 degrees. The pole is trying to cause me to fall 45 degrees. Okay. The net effect is going to be a 45 degree rise. So I'm going to go from minus 180 to about a minus 135. Okay, so this point here, so I, sh I tried this on my axis, this is 90, 180. So let me draw a negative 90. This is minus 180, this is minus 270. So right in between, we've got minus 135, where I've shown this guy peeking out. Now at that point, the zeros are done having their effect. But the pole has still got another 45 degrees to drop. So I basically drop down towards minus 180 and level off. All right, so basically what I see from this is I have two distinct crossings of minus 180, one here and one here. Now, technically I, I head towards minus 180 over time looking at this guy. However, all right, the trick about that is, remember, this is an asymptote. So what's going to happen is this guy is going to approach, but he's never going to hit negative 180. So let's look at this guy. What's that mean? Well, effectively, what that means, if I try to draw this out, is I'm going to have, so I've got constant magnitude for a while and a changing angle. That's going to give me a circle in my Nyquist plot. But then i got to be careful because I'm going to circle around apparently to minus 180, then from I'm going to basically head towards minus 270, which means I'm going to head into the into the second quadrant in this range. Then I'm going to head back into the third quadrant as I go above 180. Okay, so what's that going to look like? Well, that's going to look like this. I'm going to start out here, and I'm going to start out at 10, at a magnitude of 10. I circle around. All right. Here's where I get to the point where I have my first negative 180 degree crossing. Okay, my first 180 degree crossing. Now, from basically on the Bode plot from here to here, my angle is up in this quadrant. Okay, then essentially what I see is I cross back into the third quadrant. So I, I so here I am in the second and then I'm getting smaller because the magnitude's dropping, and I'm back into the third quadrant and headed to zero. Okay? Because I have two crossings of 180, I'm going to have two crossings of the negative real axis. Okay? So, to really understand where these crossings are, I really should go into MATLAB and look at the Bode plot and have the Bode plot tell me exactly where those crossings happened. So let's look at the actual exact Bode plot. So let me um, close that. Okay, all right. So now here's my mosaic. Okay. So let me run the code for that one. Okay, so that is this guy. All right, so I drew a couple of different plots here. Figure one, I think, is my... All right, figure one is my Bode plot. It looks sort of like what I thought he was going to do. Okay, so I see him dropping down. Now, again, he doesn't really get to negative 270, because remember, it's asymptotes. He's going to get close to minus 270. And he comes back up. So I see him definitely crossing minus 180 twice and then headed towards minus 180 as omega goes to infinity. So what I what I should do is I should go to here and find what are the frequencies where I cross 180. Well, I see that I cross 180 looks like at about 1.8 radians per second. 
all right, which means I'm going to cross it with a magnitude of, let's see, at 1.8, I cross it a magnitude of 1.24 dB, okay, 1.24 dB. So 1.24 dB, where does that sit? So I get 10 to the 1.24 divided by 20. I'm careful about my parentheses here. All right, about 1.15, okay, 1.15, all right, 1.15. Now, my other crossing, let's see where it is. My other crossing looks like it happens about here, right? So it's pretty tricky to say, but pretty close to where I thought it was going to happen. Um, looks like it happens, I don't know, right around, you know, maybe right around about, I guess, um, I don't know, between somewhere between 101 and 118. So I, I would say, I don't know, that's probably around, um, I don't know, let's just call it 110, right? 110 radians per second. So I go up here and say at 110 radians per second, where am I? I'm going to be somewhere around, I don't know, about negative 95 dB. Okay, around negative 95 dB. So I do 10 to the negative 95, 10 raised to the negative 95 divided by 20. That looks like it's about 1.77 times 10 to the negative fifth. All right. 1.77 times 10 to the negative fifth. So pretty, pretty small, okay, where that actually happens. All right. So just to verify that, right? So I see, yeah, somewhere, somewhere between those two points, I guess. Okay. About negative 95 dB. All right. So knowing that, all right, what do I do now? Well, knowing that, I can basically say that, let me draw the complete diagram now. So my complete diagram would look like, let me bring back the camera. My complete diagram now is going to look something like, this guy. Okay, the omega equal to zero part goes from here around to, apparently I said 1.15, or negative 1.15. He's going to go around, he's going to loop in and head towards zero like that. The second crossing right here, this guy is at, I said negative, I don't know, what did I say? Negative 1.7. Negative 1.77 times 10 to the minus fifth. Okay. Negative 1.77 times 10 to the minus fifth. So that means... This point right here is negative 1.77 times 10 to the minus fifth. Okay? Notice the exaggerated scale here. Okay? So I'm going around and around like that. My return side is going to go like this. Okay? Back. Um, back. Like that. Okay, so I go, I go essentially, I have to be careful about this. All right. Let me, let me draw that more carefully. Okay, so I start out at 10. I head in, cross here, cross there. So I'm going this way, this way and still that way, 
And then on the return trip, I'm going to go like that. Okay. Okay. So this point we said was negative 1.15. This guy here is negative 1.77 times 10 to the minus fifth. All right, now, here's an important thing. Let's look at MATLAB, okay? If I look at my MATLAB plot, figure two is my Nyquist. MATLAB plot hasn't really shown you that per se, right? MATLAB makes it look like I got one little loopy in here. I actually have two. And let's see that, let's zoom in. All right, this is the first crossing. I see it looks like it happens about minus 1.15 where I would think it was. But the other one's at 10 to the minus fifth, so I got to zoom in on here. Zoom in, zoom in. Oh, now I'm starting to see it. There it is. All right, that's the last loop. Okay, so I see that I basically have another point here. It looks like it's at about, I don't know, pretty close, minus 1.7 times 10 to the minus fifth. Okay, not quite perfect, but pretty, pretty close, okay, as to where that happens. All right, so, all right, tricky, tricky. All right, that's why it's important to be able to draw this kind of cartoon plot. The key thing, I think, is that when you look at that Bode plot, that you can reason to yourself, even if it's the MATLAB Bode plot, doesn't matter, right? It doesn't need to be the MATLAB Bode plot or the asymptote Bode plot. Basically, if I look at it, as long as I see that I've got two crossings of minus 180, that means I had to go up and then back. Okay? That means I had to cross twice. That information allows you to see better and understand better what's really happening. All right? So, looking at that graph, the thing for you to see is that basically, let's, let's think about the situation I'm in right now. Here I have k equal to 1. Okay, do I have encirclements of minus 1? So minus 1's right there, I guess. Okay. Do I have, so p equals 0. Right? L of s has no zeros in the right half plane. Or sorry, no, no poles in the right half plane. Now, how many net encirclements do I have in the clockwise direction? Let's see. So I'm going around clockwise. So I go around this guy once. All right. So let's see, how many times do I go around him? Basically, if I look at it, this loop goes around once in a clockwise direction. Okay. And this guy goes around once. So I, basically, you're looking at this, my outer loop goes around basically once in a clockwise direction. This guy goes around once in a clockwise direction. N equals 2. So in this scenario, z equals 2. In this scenario, with k equal to 1, I am unstable. To get this guy to be stable, I'd have to shrink this in. So in other words, I'd have to multiply this guy by 1 over 1.15. If I did that, this whole guy would shrink, and this minus 1 point would be outside the graph. Okay. So in other words, for gains for 0 to k, less than 1 over 1.15, I would be stable, okay? Here, n equals 0, okay? <clears throat> and then um, for 1, for k greater than 1.15, I become unstable. Now, as I continue to grow this guy, though, as I grow it and grow it and grow it, eventually this point's going to come in, okay? When that point comes in, so let's think about what the graph is going to look like by that point, okay? The graph is going to change at that point so that, I'll draw it bigger here. Okay. I go around this way, go around this way, and go around that way, going back this way, all right, like that. So now when minus 1 is right there, here I got the outer loop going around him clockwise once. So n equals 1, 
but this loop goes around counterclockwise. The number of net encirclements is zero. <clears throat> so basically from this, so K is stable not just for K greater than 1.15, he becomes stable again from 1.1, sorry, for K greater than 1 over whatever I have, 1.7 times 10 to the minus 5, okay? So that's going to be a big gain, okay? So I'm going to write this more clearly now. So in other words, from um, 1, point, 1 over 1.15 to 1 over 1 1.7 times 10 to the minus 5, I am unstable. And then for k greater than 1.7 times 10 to the minus 5, I become stable again. Now, just so you understand that, that basically says that for this range, for a little bit of a range, I've got two poles inside the right half plane. For low gains, I have no poles in the right half plane. And then again, I have poles back in the left half plane. Okay, so I should be able to see that when I look at my root locus. So that's why I drew the root locus as well. Okay. I think it's figure, figure three. Here's my root locus. So you see in the root locus here, you see in the root locus here that there's a point. So the poles start here for low gains, then as the gain cranks up, they, I've got two of them crossing over to the right half plane, and then they get pulled back. And if I do a quick check for sanity, I see that somewhere right around, you know, 1 over 1.15, I cross over, and as I continue to loop around, oops, I looped too far. So I continue to loop around at a gain somewhere around 50,000-ish or so. I begin to cross over. All right. Now let's let's just do a quick again sort of sanity check there. If I have one over 1.7e to the minus fifth, yeah, about 58,000-ish, about about right with my Nyquist plot. Okay. So hopefully that helps a little bit to try to understand that.